Hey everybody, it's Devin Francis, also known as the Lender Meltzner. And I introduced Devin to a whole bucket load of New Kingdom Hearts lore this week. I broke his brain. It's been a week. I broke his it's brain. It's been two weeks. I'm, look at this, I'm home. And I'm Victor, home. Which you've been home for longer. Um, I'm the I'm home too though. It's my last full day home. We're finally recording here. Um, happy fifth anniversary to the Oddcast. Woo, this happy isn't... happy anniversary, this, Devin. You too. Thank this you. isn't our celebration episode for that because this is no. what was supposed to be like in the beginning of June. This no, episode... I thought this was our celebration episode. No, our special. No, no, that was a different thing that you planned. Oh. No, I thought it's coming up in three more episodes. Oh, yeah. right. Yes. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yes. I planned so, the anniversary this time. So, um, we just passed the real life date. It was yesterday, July fourteenth. I made a post on the Facebook page that I imagine most of you saw. And I said, "Wow, it's five years, Victoria. That's a really long time we've been doing that this." That is a long time. You know what? We lasted longer than I thought we would. I didn't think we'd make it to the second episode. <laughs> Here we are, five years. We we're so young. So many episodes. Back then. We were so young. So many, I hadn't graduated. You would, wait, you had just finished yeah. grade eleven Something or grade like ten? That. I think grade Goodness. ten. You were at Selkirk. I just finished my year at Selkirk. Yeah. All right. This isn't mm. a reminiscing time. What are you talking about today? Uh, romance. All that mush, all that good stuff. Yeah. All that fluff. Uh huh. That fluffy fluff. Uh -huh. I need a pillow. Uh huh. But I don't have one. No. Nope. If I had one, I'd hit you with it, mm -hmm. so you could feel the fluff. Yes, I'm. Fe I was feeling it when I was writing this last night. Did you get emotional? A little tear go I down didn't, your cheek. I didn't know. I was just like, wow, these are long. Some of these. Um, like, wow, they should have hooked up sooner. What took them so long? Get that off the laminate thing. Um. So what are, are we doing specifically? Talking. Mm -hmm. Talking about those good fluffs. How many of them? Ten. Uh -huh. Ten good fluffs. Yes. We... Some fluff is better than others, but we're not going to rank them. <laughs> That's not our place to judge. <laughs> That's not our place to judge. Um... You can ship whatever you want to ship as much as you want to ship it. We're just here to comment on it. Yeah, in a in a very undramatic move, we decided at the last minute to not make this a countdown, but to just talk about, like... Talk about that good fluff. Talk about the top ten without putting them in a particular order, which isn't to say that these aren't in kind of a preferential order, but they're not in, like, a hard order. This isn't our, like, hard, like, this is the best. Isn't the order, like most to least episodes not perfectly in. generally speaking it is pretty close um i think you swapped around uh one of the kid couples with well i some of the it's pretty close ones. because i put the biggest most like significant romances at the top um and then we're like we're not going to sort them so it's like okay we'll just keep them in this order there's one i was surprised that you put on this list Cause it is a canon relationship. I, I, I'm guessing I can guess and which one it is. Um, they do have kids, and their yeah. kids have kids, but they aren't really shown romantically You're about much Whit in the show. Jenny? No, I'm talking about Mandy and Trent. Oh, yeah. Well, we there's like hardly any stuff. You may about remember them. Victoria that we struggled to fill out the entire list. I told you you didn't need. 10 specifically. But well, yeah, but 10. Well, like a round number. Um, so, yeah, we're just going to kind of talk about the history of some of these relationships and then talk about like our thoughts on them and just appreciate some of the nice romances we've had on the show. So, I don't want to number these because I don't want to give the impression. Let's just say the first one we're talking about. Yes. Number one is... Uh, Eugene and Katrina. I didn't realize they had so many episodes I centered around them. I know. I included ones centered around Buck, like around their family dynamic as the three of them. Not that's, just, not, that's fair. Not just around Buck, but that involved Buck in his in in relation to Eugene and Katrina. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So Eugene and Katrina, and these these are rough counts because I was I was kind of roughly estimating these counts. So you know you could be arguable some of them, but roughly. 78 episodes for Eugene, Eugene and Katrina's relationship. and Katrina are the show's OTP. 
And I think it is very easy to say that. <laughs> yes. This is the longest developing relationship on the show, so we'll kind of go through the history of the relationship. Their story begins with Katrina's introduction in Truth, Trivia, and Trina in album 19. You can alternate paragraphs if you want. Okay. Um, their friendship had this barely unspoken romantic lilt right from the start. Katrina became a Christian, and it began with Rabbit's Foot and with Handshake, which prompted Eugene to confess his feelings, but decide to distance the two of them so as not to disrupt Katrina's newfound faith. He also bought a car in that episode. Yes. Eugene went on a road trip across the country with Bernard to soulfully search his identity. He returned to Wit to find... to uh, He returned to Odyssey to find that Wit was in the Middle East, and he'd left for Israel, so he was unable to give a proper farewell. Eugene and Katrina tried to maintain healthy boundaries in their friendship, despite their mutual pining. Eventually, in album 24's The Turning Point, Katrina's father, Armitage, comes to Odyssey to bring her back to Chicago. Katrina recognizes that Eugene is being held in spiritual limbo by her presence, and that their relationship can't progress until Eugene moves forward in some way, so she returns home. Distraught, Eugene grows a breakup mustache and pours himself into his geological study, uncovering information about the mineral under what's end. He feels abandoned by Wit, Katrina, and Whitsend on top of the normal abandonment baggage he carries from his parents. He develops a search program for the Imagination Station, which he tests by searching through his life in Odyssey, all pointing him towards a decision to become a Christian. Once Blackard was dealt with, Eugene believed he could finally begin a romantic relationship with Katrina, now that they were on the same faith page. Like that website. Yeah. Yeah, Faith Page. However, she was now dating Brandon Teller at her college in Chicago. Through a series of assumptions and misunderstandings, Eugene later impulsively proposed to Katrina after learning that Brandon was currently doing the same. Katrina turned them both down and later broke up with Brandon. Don't need no man. Yeah. Katrina eventually returned to Odyssey to work at Holstein's books over summer and proposed to Eugene, finally putting a solid tent peg in their arduous back-and-forth relationship in For Whom the Wedding Bells Toll in album 29. Their engagement lasted for quite a while without much wedding discussion beyond the engagement ring debacle. Armitage used his strings at Campbell College to secure Eugene's position and got him working on Operation Think Tank. When Andromeda's plans became more aggressive, Armitage's objections left him with an equally aggressive brain tumor. Eugene and Katrina were married by, by Brandon at Armitage's bedside minutes before his death. Eugene and Katrina, now informed of the nature of the project, stole all the radio wave studies data and ran as of Plan B in album 37. They traveled the world for a significant period, conducting both covert and charitable works for a variety of organizations while dodging Andromeda's mercenaries. This included working for around-the-world missions at the Ashanti village, where Eugene's father was last seen 20 years prior, alerting Eugene to Leonard's still-living state. The couple finally returned to D.C. to continue with the RWS research without Andromeda, Andromeda's sinister oversight. Eugene, in a frantic last-ditch effort to avoid defunding, experimented on himself and wiped his memories. Since he first wiped his memories from since he first came to Odyssey, the Maltzers finally returned home to seek help from Wit. Once Eugene's memories were restored, they finally held a full wedding ceremony. They were denied by Armitage's sudden death. They found it hand up together. But we don't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we don't talk about that though. While both teaching as well as locating Leonard Meltzner and taking down Dalton Kern. But Katrina wasn't really Dalton allowed. Dalton Katrina wasn't really allowed to help take down Dalton. She ha she did the, the thing with the she, phone. She did do the thing with the it's phone. Audio. That was it. Um, as time went on, Eugene and Katrina learned they were unable to bear children, but would go on to take in Buck Oliver, their baby boy, precious baby boy Buck Oliver. The teenage con artist roped into the Green Ring Conspiracy, who had earlier been aided by Katrina and now was released from juvenile detention, my money boy. Their relationship and composition as a family continues to develop to this day. I love Eugene and Katrina so much. I love and them their and their beautiful money boy baby. Buck They're all so sweet. It's just so important to me, more so than any They're other so development on the show. I think we can both agree that they are the best family in this show, yeah. without a doubt. That it's, is something that is unanimous. It's interesting how Katrina has changed as a character, like, her her characterization over time. Like, when she was first introduced, she was basically, like, female Eugene, like, same level. Like, she didn't have the same level of social awkwardness. It's called... Smurfette principle. Yes. The Smurfette principle is when you take a male character and then you create a female counterpart 
who's like identical. Out the it's it's the Chipettes, uh, Smurfette, Minnie Mouse, um, Lola Bunny, and a bunch of other characters. Yeah. So for at least the first episode and the first couple episodes, it, Katrina had the same kind of you know we heard these conversations between her and Eugenia where they were talking about all these high intellectual historical concepts and it's not like they dumbed down katrina i wouldn't say that but they definitely had a significant shift over time in the aspects of her personality that they played up well i i don't mean to be mean to katrina i don't think it's mean to say this i don't think she was ever written to be as smart as eugene like they, they, the they seem pretty equal ground like, i mean that was the are, whole point of the first episode yeah see. they are like pretty equal except for i think like katrina isn't as certain levels of it. intelligence like that are different like katrina is far more emotionally intelligent than eugene and is like way better at getting along with people she's like way more charismatic and um eugene's more about flaunting that knowledge yeah so like you said i think the key uh, is that katrina originally was supposed to be as smart as eugene but she didn't ha share his insecurities that gave him the need to show off constantly with it yeah and then as time went on yeah they focused more on her emotional intelligence and stuff and they both went into academic backgrounds because they're both teachers now, but they put Katrina at, you know, in the public school arena and Eugene is at the college. Yeah, I think, um, I think it works better this way because Katrina's like, um, really good with kids, mm -hmm. which was like something already established. Not that Eugene isn't good with kids, but we always knew he wanted to work at the college and... Katrina, I think she was, actually was working at the college, yeah, not as like, like a TA as a, or as a teacher though, as a librarian, um, and she was tutoring and stuff. Yeah, but like even when she was tutoring, she was like tutoring younger kids and stuff. And I think that like she would just enjoy teaching younger kids mm -hmm. more than like people who are just a couple years younger than her. Yeah, I've had a number. Of not friends, that she'd be opposed to it. A number but... of friends who went into degrees and like childhood education and stuff and katrina is definitely like clearly one of those people personality yeah. wise um yeah my co-worker right now is also going into that and so is justin they're such a good couple and they had like i appreciate the diversity that we've had in the romantic journeys of different characters over the course of this show eugene and katrina's long struggle that they had over like fate. like i really appreciate the fact that it wasn't like katrina you know became a christian and she's like oh well i can't date eugene because you know he's not a christian it was actually eugene who felt the need to back off because he didn't want to hurt her personal development as she was entering this new chapter in his life they're so good for each other they complement each other so well as characters they're i wouldn't call them foils though because like Connie and yeah. Bernard and or, and Tom are more foils for Eugene. Yeah. But it's like, oh, I wish there was a word for a character that's similar enough to you that they're not a foil, but they bring out all these, like, really other great a compliment. qualities in you. Yeah, really good complementary character to each other. Yeah, they're like intelligence and wisdom, I guess. Like I was saying there, Katrina is intelligent, but that's where we we don't we see more of her wisdom as it accentuates against eugene's kind of intelligence without wisdom at times where he's like barreling forward on theory mm -hmm. and katrina and is there to keep him in check now that we're like in later episodes and they've been married for several years and stuff we don't several really years married for like oh time is weird for I'm like 15 weird. 16 weird. years oh, now man. Yeah, not in real life. Not in real Odyssey life years, though. I'm talking about, like, their years. Sometimes Odyssey follows real time. Yeah, not like that, though. Because Eugene is, like, in his... I don't know. He's, like, not even 30 yet or something like I'm that. I'm pretty sure he is. I don't he know. Was, it's confusing. He was pretty explicitly 27 during the Leonard Melsner saga. Okay. So... 
I don't even know. But anyway, um, yeah, we don't really get as many really heavy romance episodes between them, but there have been like a couple really, really good ones post hiatus that we've gotten. I can't remember either of the names though. One is the one where they go to the restaurant. There's the chem no chemistry whatsoever. Is that? Or that sorry, one? more than a feeling. Is that one? Yeah. That's the yeah, one, yeah, yeah, about their anniversary. Um, and. I don't remember if we like... decided whether that was the anniversary of their like dead dad marriage or their actual ceremony marriage. I thought it was like. I don't no, remember they, if we ever they came don't to a conclusion. Count, they don't count the actual ceremony as their wedding, though. So it would have been Armitage's death. Hey, my dad died. Let's I know, party. I know. That's um, what I mean. It's I a depressing. I would have moved it to like a different day, it's like the day before or after. Depressing personally. anniversary. So, well, maybe died but, after midnight. Um, <laughs> I don't know. But uh, anyway. Mm, you can hear a clock chiming like in the, the background in the hospital. The couple episodes that surround um, them finding out that they can't have a baby. Yeah. Are like really good. And Eugene trying to like figure out ways to comfort Katrina. And to Katrina, mend a repair like, is an incredible. Like that, I think, post hiatus, Eugene, Katrina, Eugenia, whatever you like calling them. Eugenia. Yeah. Um, I think that's the best episode when it comes to their relationship. Because it's like. The writing's really strong, and, like, it just shows how good they are for each other. Yeah. And everything is beautiful. They had a bunch of good scenes in Green Green Conspiracy as they were trying to figure, well, you know, Eugene mm -hmm. is trying to keep Katrina from becoming too over-invested in Buck because he's worried about her safety and stuff. And now they have, like, all these really good moments where they talk about um parenting and stuff and katrina's like maybe you should do this and blah, 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 blah. and like it's good they love their money boy so much this oh and it's so good as a family dynamic now that buck is there i love them so much i'm glad that like with their emotional intelligence katrina gets the experience of getting to you know help raise and mentor younger kids through school and tutoring and time at wit's end and stuff like that but you know they're so advanced in the things that they're able to do i'm glad you know there's a definitely strengths to the fact that they were able to jump right to the age that buck is mm -hmm. in terms of raising him same and thing I, with connie <laughs> i've said it before and i'll say it again i love so much the fact that we get to see the dynamic of buck being raised by them as a foster child when eugene himself was a foster child they and don't has talk gone through some struggle enough, and they though. barely mention it. They don't it. talk about it enough. They like for anyone who typing in the comments or whatever, like, oh they talk about it every now and then it's like, yeah, every now and then, not enough. We still I want don't, an entire episode. We still don't even or know we, we still don't even know if Buck knows like anything Brits about Eugene's or family history like yeah we don't even know if Everett. he knows that Eugene lost his parents in the jungle and that they were like held captive you know and what? then he just came back and was still alive and that Freaking Eugene has a brother and that they're in Africa now. Leonard and Everett probably don't even know about Buck yeah I know so like we don't it's even not know if, just a one we don't even know if Leonard's street. still alive because when he went back to the Chandi village he was only given a couple years to live oh man that's true I never thought of that's depressing okay thanks Devin Oh, that means like Everett only got to know Leonard for two years. Before I'd like Leonard to. Died. Well, he said it could have been. He could have. It could have been as many as like six years or even more. I know, but like who knows? Assuming he is dead, he's just he's being raised by that cross of Cortez sneak. It wasn't. I don't trust him. No, no, no. It was, Dan Isidro was the one who went on the worldwide tour, right? It was that other guy who went to the Ashanti. Oh, is this the guy who hung out with Jimmy? Dan Isidro hung out with Jimmy. And was in Cross of Cortez. Okay, wait. I think he's the one, one who went on the... Then? He's a guy we didn't know before. Oh. Well, and I don't trust him either, so... He was working for Dalton Kern the whole time. Everett needs to come back. Yeah. And also be raised by Eugene and Katrina. They can have two baby boys! I know. It would be so good! Oh, that would be excellent. Oh um, my gosh. And then, like, they could give each other hand-me-downs and it'd be beautiful. I would cry. I would cry so much. There's so many good things. There's... 
Eugene's gonna ha- he like keeps all his old vests and they're gonna be like little tiny ones and he's gonna put them on Buck. It's like a Halloween costume. Buck is gonna dress, dress up, up like as Eugene. like Eugene and Jules is gonna dress up like Connie, but that's not because it's a, her Halloween costume. It's because she, she didn't want to dress up clothes. and she steals Connie's clothes all the time and it's just like so perfect. <laughs> oh. Good, Good times, stuff. yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, I love Eugene and Katrina so much. And I'm just so happy. They're good. But and it's the thing nice. is, like, they, the writer, was it Paul? Who was like, we can't give them a kid because they ruin everything. And then they give them Buck, and then they become 50 times better. And it's like, what? Yeah, I felt like they, they dialed Katrina's character back a bunch after they came back from the Ashantis. I like, agree with there was, that. I think part of she it was also... She doesn't get to, like, use her intelligence Yeah, part much. of it was also the shift in voice actress kind of threw things off, I guess. Yeah, um, not that the current voice actress isn't good. No, it was she, just, like, all these good. changes happening at once Like, I didn't even know it was a new voice actress for a long time. But, yeah, I feel like since the hiatus, we're finally getting to actually see... Katrina in action Morgan especially since we're now seeing her from a teacher's per perspective in all these episodes with the kids and not just in relation to Buck and Eugene but the fact that Buck is here means even more Katrina and Eugene interactions which is excellent and lovely and I love it so much um the fact Millie that could even like... come back now that we know that Millie's still kicking that's true the fact that um time to finally bring in Katrina's it... brothers <laughs> time, to, time to wrap up yeah I like Katrina's at. brothers um the fact that, like, they didn't bring in Katrina for a really long time post hiatus probably doesn't help. Because, like, her character might have taken, like, a little bit of a kick for that. But she's good. It's she's good. good. And it's nice to and have... And so is Eugene. It's nice they to have good. characters in a relationship who are, you know different from each other and complement each other without them having to be one's the messy one, one and one's, one's the neat one. one. I'm so it. glad when character when it's not like we have to play like these opposite foils for every single relationship. Like that's not how every couple is. Yeah. And that's nice to me. And same thing with our next one. I mean, might as well move on now to our second couple. I'm guilty of the messy and neat one because that's totally Shaxx and Dust. Yeah, I know. Well, most but like, most couples in fiction but are like that. Leah and M though they are equal, so I'm good on that front. But they're not really a couple. So. Couple number two is uh, it's probably the second most obvious one at this moment in time, which is Penny and Wooten. Uh, who have roughly 37 episodes, aka the couple I didn't think I would ship. But now is the air I breathe. I'm still, I'm still like, I, I like them, but I don't feel like I really am like emotionally like the, super invested in them. The thing with me and them is, um, I didn't think I'd like them. Until Wellington came into the but equation. No, no, it was actually pretty early on that I started liking them. And I think the moment that really clicked it for me, like everything into place for me was, oh, I can't remember what it's called, but the episode where... Penny shows Wooten that church in the meadow and mm -hmm. stuff like out that. Out of the woods. Yeah, out of the woods. Um, that was a great... That was like the moment where I was like, okay, they are going to be an amazing couple. I think that Eugene and Katrina are the best couple in the show, but I think that Penny and Wooten are the cutest couple in the show. And they're still in their honeymoon phase right now, so everything that we still hear from them is so like they're like fluff. emotional they're and pure fluffy, fluff. yeah. And yeah, they're very emotional. And Penny in the flood episodes, being like, "I'm so worried about Wooten," and me being like, "Oh my gosh, um, <laughs> my feelings." It's funny, like when I was writing these descriptions out the history of the relationships, I was like, "This is like borderline like a BGTO." What I'm writing here, the Pretty beginner's much. guide videos. Beginner's guide to, to Odyssey romance. To ships. Um, so, Penny and Wooten. Uh, you can start if you want, because I'm going to sneeze. Penny first appeared. Go sneeze in the corner. <coughs> Punishment. Go in the corner. Penny first appeared as Connie's eccentric art artistic classmate in album 53's Green Ring Conspiracy. Wooten had had little previous romantic history to her knowledge, save for Victoria Jameson and wooing Wooten. 
Penny and Wooten shortly met after Penny appeared, and their shared eccentric personalities and love of the visual arts meant they hit it off immediately. They became close friends instantly, and Wooten's unrequited crush... Bleh, 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 unrequited crush, I can't talk, was consistently evident, although Penny's true feelings towards Wooten were unknown for a long time. Despite a lack for any previous romantic discussion between the two, Wooten proposed to Penny at the end of album 58's Ties That Bind. Penny spent all of album 59 discerning her feelings for Wooten and God's will for their relationship, with help from the Parkers for pre-pre-marital counseling. Oh, okay, I didn't hear because it's a little... Yeah. I got worse with the paragraph breaks after yeah, the first one. Yeah, I noticed one. that. There's um, no paragraph breaks. Well, the first one was super long compared to all the other ones. Uh, she decided to the affirmative, and they were wed in a very Bassett wedding, album 61. Their, Wellington! Their honeymoon also involved world travel, and also ended with the groom having amnesia. Penny and Wooten were separated after they were unwittingly caught up in a smuggling operation, and Wooten's memories were temporarily erased. Since reuniting and returning to Odyssey, they finished the construction of Wooten's new house to replace the one that burned down in album 58. And... And Wellington was there. Wellington was there, yes. Wellington was there. So, yeah. What a good boy. Um, what Best boy. Wellington is best boy. I guess you could look at the, our first two ships that we have here and say one is the messy one and one is the neat one. One because, is the messy one and one is the neat one. Because we have... No, they're both messy. Oh, wait, yeah, no. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Con yeah. Because um, now we have the ship where both of them are the messy, eccentric, wild, you know chaotic good ones yeah when they they first met in the green room conspiracy and was like oh here we go poor connie feeling like a third wheel immediately i was like which then carried on this, throughout this connie's Wooten life thing. for the next several years yeah poor connie and then she like had that breakdown yeah. on candid conversations because let's be honest that's all candid conversation it's is true good for. Um, I like to think it's that, like... the public emotional crisis show. I like to think no one actually listens to Candid Conversations Unless they're anymore. in for some drama. Unless they're like, oh, I'm in the mood for some drama. I need me some of that wits and drama. Connie, like, you know how, tell me about your emotional You life. know how TVs have the emergency broadcast system? Candid Conversations with Connie is the personal emergency yeah. broadcast system. Yeah. Um, sometimes people, um, because they know that like, Wit tells them that it's kind of down with views, so unless, like, mm -hmm. they get more people tuning in, mm -hmm. they're gonna have to cancel it. People feel bad. What they do is they turn their radio on to that channel, yeah. then they go on vacation, yeah. and they just leave it playing while they're gone. It's like, uh, And that's how Connie gets Because there's also, the like, Mom's the Word when everyone was spilling their secrets, there was also the secrets yeah. being spilled at the beginning of Novacom by like Cal and Alex talking about Eugene's RWS study at the college. We had Tom, like just a couple episodes before at the very beginning of Novacom, accidentally having Connie pump him out of like all his financial woes on the air. <laughs> but like, I... Connie asking Mitch about his secrets <laughs> in secrets. I don't know if like this is a bad writing thing at this point like the fact that whenever candid conversations is on we can be like okay either we're gonna get a uh, info dump of like something that's only gonna be relevant for this episode or connie's gonna have a breakdown like though there are only two things that this can be there's going to be one or it's going to be the other one and i don't know about you but i thought wooten's crush would only be like a couple episode thing and then once we got out of the green ring and it was like still going on and like a penny saved, a penny earned and stuff, I was like, okay, it'll probably end soon. And then once you get to like everything with like, um, in Childish Things with like her working in the museum and her reading like Wooten's body language, mm -hmm. you're like, this isn't going to go away. Yeah. I was so frustrated for the longest time, like just... It took me a long time to like Penny. It took me a really long time to like Penny. Um, I was really worried about how it was going to go because of how, like, how deep Wooten was emotionally investing himself into this idea that he wasn't communicating to Penny at all. And we had no internal monologue, really, on how Penny felt about Wooten beyond their friendship. I mean, like, uh, I, I'm never going to go over the fact that, like, 
she'd never shown any romantic interest in him in any way. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, someone might be able to argue that in Childish Things, when she said, like, oh, some people looking over here might think we're on a date or we're in love. And Mm -hmm. it's like, well, that's still not really even... That shouldn't count anyway, yeah. but I guess someone could argue that if they really wanted to. Um, she never showed, like, any romantic feelings for him. And then it was very anime-esque, in my opinion. <laughs> yes. But, like, that's the thing with Japanese culture, though. You tell someone you love them, and then you ask them out. But, like, that's not really something that we do... In our neck of the woods. And it was, it's like, would you marry me? He was like, would you marry me? And that's, like, very different. I would have been like, hey, want to go out on a date sometime? It was like, and then it was like, nope, want to marry me? Arranged Ah. marriage levels of sun. (laughs) Yep. And by the way, I I mean, um, I'm glad at least that that they bounce it out by not having the typical end Mm. everywhere else in the media. When someone proposes, you're expected to respond immediately. And I just dumped one. Penny took an entire entire album, half album, to spend the entire season, like you know, seriously and prayerfully (laughs) pondering over what she would answer to that proposal. I think like all but one episode, which I think was about bikes. Um dumb bikes. Cycle of fear. No, that was the next album. Water all over That was album sixty, because that's the cover up for sixty. Okay. Well we had episodes like Into the Woods and Dinner Roll Models and all those ones. So I remember we oh was it like a BTV? No. Or I think we spent basically the whole thing except no, some of them spent one more episode that than last. Maybe it was the it. bank episode with Eugene in the bank. Oh, I could. Been... And it was like Vance. Oh my gosh. Vince King. The bank episode. I hate that episode so much. I I heard someone say Honey Pot the other day, and I was just thinking about like, Ugh, oh, I know Honey Pot never got any resolution. Too easy to solve. Ended. Hey, Devin, remember that episode where Eugene helps out at the bank because, like, there's all this weird stuff going on and there's, like, you mean You mean when the, the, it was an inside job, that one? Yeah. <sighs> oh, my gosh. We could be talking about, like, 50 different episodes right now. <laughs> Do you think, like, there's a little, like, break the glass hammer thing in every single bank in Odyssey and instead of, like... 911 it's just like eugene's number on speed dial and i mean in fairness he wasn't in case of the secret room yeah he wasn't in the show in case in the secret room i know i'm just saying he's there he are didn't more... even exist in odyssey yet that was all him too i'm just saying there if he was he would have been there yes i, can I agree guarantee that. i'm just saying there are even more bank episodes where Ooh, mysterious robbery turns out it was an inside job from the people who worked there than even eugene has been in well, if you listen really closely, he was you can there. Hear him. He was there in spirit. Um, Eugene was actually stumbling through the basement in the dark uh-huh. after Wit got knocked out. Eugene and... actually was the skeleton of Spencer Bar. <laughs> He's Spencer just so Barfield. skinny they couldn't tell it was yeah. a real person. Um, and just like how Wit is Jay and Jack and everyone. Eugene is in every bank episode. Yeah. He's every yeah. skeleton in Odyssey. He's every skeleton, all of them. He's Jay died becomes every, so many times. Eugene is every, or Devin. Jay is every character, but once he dies, he becomes Eugene. Devin, yes. Devin. It makes sense because Eugene does have a tombstone with his name on it. Next episode. <laughs> Next episode. Um, yep. Yeah. So... Yeah, Penny and Wooten. Oh, very yeah, adorable, Penny. I forgot we were talking about couple. them. <laughs> so, they are adorable. Couple number they three, Controversy. Contro- that's their ship name. Yeah. Um, Connie and Mitch with uh, roughly 28 episodes. Connie Kendall has had a number of romantic or almost romantic entanglements over the years, but none as serious as Robert Mitchell. Mitch came to Odyssey as the community relations representative for Novacom. He quickly fell for Connie and vice versa, although she wasn't aware that he was secretly the hacker mole Aram. 
leaking Andromeda's illicit activities and plans to strategic targets. Despite her strong feelings for Mitch, Connie was wary of the obvious number of secrets he kept. This culminated in the night that he was declared dead, found, and killed by Andromeda for leaking the details of Operation Think Tank. Connie's mourning was severe, learning that the secrets for which she distrusted Mitch were his failed attempts to save lives from a dangerous corporation. When visiting Maine to see his sister, Connie learned that Mitch was still alive, taken in and faked, and his death faked by the Witness Protection Agency, and now working with the FBI to continue, uh, blah, blah, to continue the battle against Andromeda. They continued secret instant messaging chats until Andromeda was exposed and Mitch was able to return to Odyssey. With the tension of world domination clear, their relationship progressed rapidly, making up for the lost time while Mitch was in hiding. Another spanner was soon thrown into the works, however, when the FBI approached Mitch for hiring. He would have to relocate for basic training and after much deliberation decided to accept maintaining a strained, long-distance relationship with Connie. To ease tensions, Connie decided on a road trip with Joanne Allen to Washington to visit Mitch. Her arrival coincided with, coincided. Coincided with Mitch's acceptance into the International Counterterrorism Academy in Budapest. In a last-ditch effort to hold on to the relationship, they decided to get married on short notice so Connie could make the move to Mitch with, with Mitch to Hungary. Um, she decided at the last minute, however, this wasn't what she wanted, and realizing this wasn't her calling and that Mitch was increasingly putting up his job, putting his job above his relationship with Connie, they parted. And Mitch later visited Odyssey, engaged to a fellow agent, to rub it in Connie's face. No, that's those last couple words. So. Connie and Mitch. And then, and then Chris was <laughs> like, ah, losers who shipped them. They, a thing. And then let it go. Ended. Let it go. And it was like, amazing. <laughs> um, counter to what many may think, and I've had to say this quite a few times, um, I do think Connie and Mitch are a good couple, or at least they were, and then they steadily weren't. And I'm glad they aren't a couple anymore. Yeah. I yeah, never said understood it lots of times. when I was younger um, why people still wanted them to be a couple, even after everything with Budapest and them not getting married and everything, because, like, they might have started off, like, not that bad for each other, but then by the time everything else went down, it was like, okay, these two, they should not be together. Yeah. And a lot of people were upset about that and that is why Mitch came back so the writers could be like oh no he married another person oh I guess he can never be with Connie yeah I bet there's still like that one person out there somewhere who's like well maybe he'll divorce Marie oh I'm sure it's more than one and person then he'll hook up with Connie and then they're like oh my gosh J Jeff Jeff Lewis he's back and he might be a romantic thing with Connie. And people are like, well, maybe Jeff and Maureen can be a Jeff, thing. Jeff and Mitch are going to get married and, and leave Connie alone. Connie's, Ultimate plot twist. Connie's just going to be alone and cry. It's going to be the Jules, legend of Korra. Jules and is going to move out. Connie's going to have no one. I don't understand how Connie can pay rent for her house and everything. Because even when she did live with Penny, she's like, we're struggling for cash to pay for everything. And now it's just well, her. Well, she doesn't pay rent. So, or like pay The house for, is owned. She does have mortgage payments. Well, like pay for the mortgage. That's like the entire point of why she went into the Miss Odyssey pageant. Yeah. She's like, I need money. And then she got money. And then Penny moved out like right after. <laughs> Probably because it was too expensive to live with Connie. The real reason she married Wooten. What a shit. Get all that sweet comic book dough. <laughs> I mean, Wooten is very rich. Yes. So. And the, as we all nice know, Wellington is going to leave guy. him a redonkulous amount of mo money once he dies. So. And she can buy so many things in Kingdom Hearts. She can buy so many things. Um, no, it's money. It's, I thought that's what you were trying to pronounce. No, I just said money okay. wrong and then i rolled with it all right no it's it's still money in kingdom hearts it's just spelled weird i thought you were just saying it with like an umlaut no i don't know maybe i U. was maybe um I was. to emphasize the difference in pronunciation no i say money like a lot i'm like i got 100 money and people are like what's wrong with you and i'm like it's a video game thing you scrub and then i walk away and you i cash, never talk filthy, to them again you filthy cash 
Um, no, yeah, Connie and Mitch had, like, I'm glad that the relationship happened for a number of reasons. It was, like, a good As we've expressed before, it and had we a talked lot of about good lessons. in our interview with Kathy, I think it's an important thing for Stoff to recognize that just because something happens in our life and it doesn't see itself through to the end in the way we think that it should, that doesn't mean that it wasn't beneficial or that God didn't ordain it. And this was a lesson that was shown really well in the show with Connie's book when she she's like, I feel like God's calling to me to write this book. She writes the book, she finishes it, it's all deleted, and that's the end of it. And she's like, why did this happen? And was like, the you... God, just because God wanted you to write sucks. the book doesn't mean he wanted you to publish it. You still had a lot of important experiences from the process of writing this book. Connie and Mitch both grew like so much as people. And now whenever like any important emotional things happen to Connie... Um, she makes usually like, ones that PTSD relate to, jokes about her relationship with yeah, Mitch. Yeah, usually ones that relate to romance. <laughs> she comments on things with Mitch, which like... There are big lessons that she learned, and she learned more about, like, her preferences and what like, she wants and doesn't want to have Don't decide on a five-minute decision to move to Europe, to Eastern Europe, because of a boy. Budapest it sounds like a bug with a different religion. Yeah. And by the I mean, I think anyone should be very able to see that by the time that Novacom ended... Everything that happened between Connie and Mitch from that was point forward struggle. was increasingly and increasingly showing how they were not good together, how Mitch was consistently putting Connie beneath his concern for his job and his work, and how it doesn't necessarily, I mean, it's, it's kind of bad, but it's like, you know, he wanted to do good things and help people, and what Connie needed out of the relationship is not compatible with what Mitch was putting into the relationship. And so... He ended up with Maureen because that is someone who shared his line of work, who and shared she's a his criminal desires, and he's a criminal. yeah, shared his desires and his passions and their ability to work compatibly together, unlike Connie and Mitch. I would argue that there's even like a lot of scenes in Novacom, like early Novacom, where Mitch could have done a lot of things differently, mm -hmm. like heads up to Connie sooner. That he wasn't dead, so she didn't have all that trauma to go through and everything. Like, maybe put her in the witness protection program, too, considering she freaking got kidnapped. Would she kidnapped. have had to fake her own death as well, then? She could have just said, like, I'm going on a trip I guess away so. because of the emotional trauma that was triggered by my boyfriend who I was very close to dying and the fact that like being we, assassinated yeah we, that's fair we went through like a lot of stuff and then he died and we never got to resolve it and I need time to myself you're right you're right because everyone would have been like yeah girl take all the time you need and then she'd like go party in the Bahamas with Mitch <laughs> or whatever and it'd be great but um yeah, they, there are a lot of things that they could have done a lot better um, on both their sides. And I think my favorite Connie and Mitch scene is definitely the one where they figure out that they're not good for each other in um, Something Blue. In Something Blue, part two, right after Mitch gets kidnapped. And then that's like, like even. Um, just, like, all the acting in that part and all the lines and, like, everything that Kathy wrote, it's so good with Mitch being like, that was awesome, and Connie being like, that was terrible. Yeah, no, it is and... really good, and I really like how they acknowledge, like, during Novacom, we weren't able to see these incompatibilities in our relationship because life was going so crazy and nothing was normal, and so we were kind of forced into these terrible situations, which put us, like, caused us to be different people or have to focus on different things that you don't want in your like resting permanent situation and so for that season in our lives you're like this is okay because we're just trying to get through what's going on right now but once it all settled and you start seeing the thorns in your boots and it's like you know what that we want fundamentally different things out of life I'm gonna say something super controversial. And I just really like that the show spent so much time developing this relationship that didn't end up 
working out. Me too. And, you know, ended amicably. And then it was like, you know, we both still like each other and, but we're different people going in different directions and that's just the way life is. And, and I it, like that Connie struggled when she saw Mitch again, but it wasn't like too big a thing. Because yeah. like if she just saw him again and they were like completely fine, that would be terrible. Was, and if and she was, saw him again and she was like, oh, why won't he take me back and just like pitying herself the entire time and didn't like Maureen at all, that would also be terrible. Yes. And they went with like a good middle road with that. I think they went but, with the most realistic um, road, which isn't, oh no, mm -hmm. I'm still in love with him. It's the, I'm still single right now. Did I like give up on a chance that I should have taken yeah, because like now I'm going to be, thing. what I'm going to be single forever now because I like let this opportunity slide. So it was less of like a personal thing and more of like a, an opportunistic romantic kind of thing, which is very understandable when you're in, you know, when you're Connie's age and you continue to age on and you're like, ah, everyone else, what's uh, slipping me by? Anyway, I'm going to say something super controversial. Okay, go for it. Get us those views. Okay. Uh, you think that you like Connie and Mitch more than you actually do. Or you like them for some of the wrong reasons. What a, you're everyone... saying it's a nostalgic thing? No, I think it's um, the fact that so many things were going wrong at the time of Novacom. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, everything is bad. And then it's like, hey, there are these two people and they really like each other. And that's nice. So I'm going to cling to the positives. I see. And then it just like makes, like, it's the one positive thing that you can just really hold on to. And yeah, I'd argue that people, that might be like, one reason why people still hold on to it for so long but with like you and me mm -hmm. we knew everything that was going to go after and all that stuff yeah. so it wasn't as big a deal for us so we wouldn't really that's a good understand that good perspective as much. and so I like think, that might make people like them more than they should i think i've brought this up before and i definitely have with other things the breakup of connie and mitch is one of those things where i really want to know what it was like to experience when it happened not knowing that it was coming like i knew mm -hmm. that connie and mitch didn't end up together and so i wonder like because of the other romances in the show and usually it's like oh we see this development this build up and then it works out and it's okay and now we're married and whatever and then they have kids and blah 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 and our all biggest stuff. odyssey what if is what if we'd actually listen to things chronologically <laughs> um yeah and it's interesting to me to think like with all of the build-up and all the stuff that connie and mitch went through when he died and then he came back to life and then all of these things that went on and then they're finally getting married and then they don't i really want to know what the reaction of the fandom and listeners and what ours would have been going into that and finding out like oh all of a sudden they are not getting married because i'm sure that would have been a shock do you Maybe think we I'm not sure. It out, that I don't know because there was a lot of stuff. Leading, so it might not have been a shock, and I don't know if we would have been surprised by it or not. And that's one of the I things I want to like know. I would have taken it. Thought they were gonna get married, but I would have been upset about it. Yeah, I think I would have figured that they would be married, but I would have been very impressed by the fact that they didn't. Yeah, I would be like, um, I think they're going to because they really did lean heavily in that direction. But at that point, like we already said, you could tell they weren't really that great for each other. Mm -hmm. And it'd either be like, oh, maybe they won't last minute, or maybe their relationship will develop really well after they do, and they might not write Connie out of the show, and we'll just have episodes with them every now and then, kind of like we did for Pokenberry with the Barclays, except for the fact that we only got like three of those, and we're not going to talk about that. But anyway, yeah. We got four. It's wild how many times like main characters have been completely written out of or almost written out of the show. Like, or, Wit left and may have never yeah, came we, back when, when Hal Smith died. Um, Eugene left through all of Novacom and they didn't know if he'd ever come back, and he almost did leave again in a new era. I was going to say, like, what I don't if think they ever planned on having Connie, Connie and Eugene, or Connie and Mitch, moved back mm -hmm. a little bit. What if Connie, like, lost connections with everyone in Odyssey, which would never happen, but what if it did, and then she never found out Eugene came back? Feelings. Um, so, next relationship. Let's barrel through these. We're three in. Um, but they'll get shorter as we go on. 
hopefully. No, um, they're going to get way shorter as we go on. Number four, Wit and Jenny. Seven episodes. I mean, okay. Know. John Avery Whitaker first met Guinevere Morrow with both feet planted squarely inside his mouth. Nice. Studying at the University of Southern California, Whit barely managed to pull out of the nosedive start to their friendship and followed it up by asking Jenny out, only to find out that not only was she already dating someone, but that that someone was Whit's best friend, Jack Allen. Good job, Whit. Whit and Jenny grew closer and closer as they helped each other out with their public speaking and writing, respectively. When Jenny revealed to Whit that she didn't see her relationship with Jack becoming anything serious, Jack found out and spiraled out of control with suspicion and jealousy. Eventually, Whit and Jenny got together with Jack's blessing. They went on to get... Eventually. Yeah. After some rough patches, they went on to get married and have three children, Jerry, Jana, and Jason. They moved from Chicago to Odyssey to slow things down. Jerry died in Vietnam after being drafted. Jana eventually moved to California and Jason joined the NSA. Whit was a middle school teacher while continuing to run the Universal Press Foundation while Jenny engaged in various activism efforts. After Whit retired, Jenny was engaged in the battle to save the Fillmore Recreation Center when she was suddenly overtaken by chronic glomerulonephritis oh, thank you due for to reading a that strep part. complication and passed away very quickly. Whit brought the fill. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I did kind of trip over the L in glomerulon. Um, because it's funny. They do say it a bit incorrectly in the episode, which I don't blame them for if you aren't aware of the they roots. They should have had that guy to help them out with the... The names like they did in that OAC episode. Yeah, if you aren't aware, I guess, of the roots in slag glomerulonephritis, the the R and the L catch on each other. That um, word hurts Then me. It, it makes sense that you might mess up with it. If you're not terribly familiar with microscopic kidney anatomy, mm -hmm. um, like I am, Wit bought the Fillmore and turned it into Wit's End in Jenny's memory. Wit has shown little romantic interest then apart since then, apart from a marginally romantic period with Margaret Bay. Yeah, but he didn't reciprocate those feelings. No, but they he was... They went on dates. They did go on dates, so that's why I was like marginally, but... They went on dates, but I don't really think he considered them dates. More just like hang out with your bud time. No, I don't think that Wit was romantically interested in Margaret, but he clearly knew that there's a romantic connotation that to what was happening. That jerk leading her on. I know. I w uh, no, so that's I why I was like, that, but... I'll at least mention it. Yeah, that's fair. And like a totally trolled romance between him and... Um, and uh, Lily Graham? Yeah, Lily. Recently on the yes. OAC. Um, In February of this year of our Lord, 2018. There are so many good moments with these two. These two are always like top of the game whenever they have bits together there's literally everything with the triangle the triangle is so good and also um, the end of recollection not, makes not me want to cry list. every time silent night makes me want to cry every time good. um also uh that recent episode with emily mm -hmm. where great expectations, yeah, great expectations where i guess it's not that recent anymore but right. um with talking to Jenny on the phone and being like all excited and I do you hear her in the episode? Yes. Yeah, okay. They're like really cute. They have like two seconds of screen. She's time, like, I'm pregnant. But they're really cute. It's so cute. Um But like even when they're older and it's like all grumpy and stuff, she's like, Oh, you're such a sour puss and he's like, Mmm and they're really cute. And they're if it weren't for Penny and Wooten, they would be like the number one cutest couple in Odyssey. But then you can get more screen time. So, but like, it's close. It's very close. It's almost a tie between those two in my mind. Um. Oh, and like, just listening to like Clara and knowing about like, oh, thinking about that rain. and like, with sadness with and like, and that and the, just his, the, and his emotions about the fact that Jenny had just died in oh, relation to it? what happened with Clara and what's, with Jack and the betrayal, the, name, the heartbreak. The name's on the tip of my tongue. The, the 16, album 16. Oh yeah, Mortal Coil. Yeah, the Mortal Coil, all the bits and that. And which just like I, I want to s and stay like, cyber dead so I can be and, with you. And Hal's voice uh -huh. when he sees Jenny uh -huh. and he's like Jenny, and it's like, how dare you do? Just like the way he reads that line and how happy he is and emotional, like 
just that one word is one of the best deliveries in all of Odyssey from all the voice actors. And it's just one word. And there's like so many feelings in it that just by hearing that one word, it could bring a grown man to tears. Like it is mm. so good. And that grown man is wit. Because he's crying. Because he's emotional. And also me. And also Devin. <laughs> um. Um, also the triangle honorary mention. Because they weren't really on this list. We contemplated putting them on it. But then we didn't. Because they don't really have that much stuff. But Jack and Emily. Honorary mention for Jack and Emily. Which transitions. Jack's in... first wife. Yeah. Transitions into the next couple. Which is. Yuck and Joanne. And they're so good together. And you know why? Because he gave her an elevator. Yeah. That's what romance is, folks. So, t 10 episodes for Jack and Joanne. I gave them. Um, by the time Jack Allen moved to Odyssey at Nam 21, he was already a widower, having lost his first wife, Emily, to cancer. He met Joanne Woodston in The Decision in album 28 when she came to town. A member of the UPF board, she was sent to Odyssey to help Wit make his decision on whether or not to leave town once more for an extended international missions tour. They felt for each other very quickly and commuted back and forth regularly between Odyssey and Chicago. In album 29's For Whom the Wedding Bells Toll, they purchased a local antique shop together creating J&J's antiques before taking off on a missions trip together. They split their time between the shop and Odyssey, and Odyssey and traveling for missions work until they finally decided to retire to Scotland and home again to Album 56, leaving the store to Jason Whitaker. So now it's J&J and J Antiques. Yes. They should just call it J squared. Cube? J cubed, that's what I meant. But like J-A-Y, mm -hmm. and then it'll be run by Wit and J and Jack. But they're also all J, too. But they're all J. Yeah. They're all the same person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, these are the two cinnamon rolls of the list because they are so good and they're so beautiful. And I love them so much. When Joanne first appears in Jack Caesar and he's just like... <laughs> <laughs> he just dies immediately on the he's spot. Like, he's like 80 years old and, and he's just like dumbstruck with love. <laughs> it's adorable. So beautiful. He's a grandfather. So cute. He's the world's best grandfather. Excuse Times like seven you. or however many mugs he had. Yeah. He's just he's won every single I wish year. they'd literally ever explicated like Jack's offspring. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Because there's, what, two mentions of him being a grandfather, right? Yes. Yeah. The weather. Yes. And the mug. Yes. Yeah. Mugs. Mugs. Yeah, I couldn't remember if there's a third one or not. I I can't think of a third one. Um, yeah. In fact, hate... I'm, I'm surprised I thought of the weather so quickly. I'm upset that they've never detailed that. You know what, you know what I'm upset about? The fact that they're in Scotland and not here, and also the fact that both of the voice actors have passed away now. All of those things, uh -huh. and also the fact that they haven't made a spin-off Adventures in Odyssey audio series that Jack this is the main character. That reminds me, news, news, interjection, news. Uh, three days ago on the AIO Big Facebook news. page, they finally announced, which I've been wait. I found out Secret Scoop like two years ago, and I've been waiting for it to happen. You never told me. Oh, yeah. We, I we talked about it numerous times. Wait, I thought you said they canceled it, though. I thought they did, and I guess they didn't. They're finally okay. putting out the Young Wit novel News. series. And it's because of us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, they're finally making a series of Odyssey novels about Young Wit. Um <sighs> So if you Quit go to the her. link in the description, you can see there's a preview and go a little buy bit it. a little bit of the book is go on there. Buy it. It's not available to buy yet, but there's Go pre-order. There is a preview to that you can read. It is called Young Wit and the Traitor's Treasure. Is Jack in it? Do we know if Jack's in it? I would assume it? that Jack is in it. Do you think Charlotte's in it? I that would make sense. Do you think I don't have any other <laughs> Things to say. Well, Fiona may be in it. Janeth will certainly not. What about Harold will probably what about, be in it. Uh, Wilfred. Uh, 
Agnes Wilson. Yeah, not Agnes's Perhaps, first husband. Yeah, Wilbur Lee is in it, <laughs> which is an inter- is in interesting decision. <laughs> Cameo. It turns out Wilbur and Wilson were actually the same person the whole time, and it's just been a cover up. He faked his death. He faked his death so he can and marry he married Charlotte. Charlotte, which is interesting because. Because Jenny was the one who introduced Tom and Agnes Wait, to each other. Wait, no, I'm not going to give you any more ideas. Never mind, this is a horrible idea. What a tangled web we weave. No, I shouldn't have said anything. This is horrible. Um, yeah, I love Jack and Joanne. They are good. They're All of these couples are good. They're just like... Except for Connie and Mitch. They're the grandparents of like every child in Odyssey. Basically, yeah. in a in a different way than like especially the Mandy. We're just like yeah, yeah, oh, especially man. Mandy. Everything with Mandy and Jack from and Joanne like, yeah. is so beautiful. From tornado that I can't even express to the pact words ever. Like I can't. That's I why know. I'm bad with words. Uh-huh. It's because of those. It's their three. fault. It's their fault. Um. Speaking of Wilbur, <laughs> what? Go on. Are you waiting for me to talk? I was waiting for you. Okay. okay, Tom and Agnes. Ten episodes. Tom Riley's first wife died from cancer around 1930, 1973, about a year after his son, Timmy Riley, also died. Agnes's first husband... I'm trying to, not to say... Um, Angus. Agnes's first husband... You your long cloth, <laughs> Agnes. <laughs> Agnes's first husband, a train mechanic named Wilbur Lee, also died from cancer around the same time. Three years later, Tom and Agnew. Agnew. (laughs) Tom Tom and Agnew were married. You remember when Tom married the former vice president of the United States of America? (laughs) Tom and Agnew were married. He didn't marry Agnes until several years after. Uh, Tom and Agnew were married around 1976 when Agnew learned how Timmy had died. She and Tom tried for a long time to have another child, but she was unable to conceive. The grief of losing Wilbur, the vicarious grief of Timmy and Tom's first wife, and being unable to bear a child herself, started slipping her into a deep depression with psychosis. As her condition progressed, Agnew went out less and less. And Tom stopped telling Tom people, people about Agnes' illness. Around 1993, Agnes was moved full-time to the Hillingdale Haven Mental Health Center on the outskirts of town. Tom continued to visit his wife regularly, but most people who came to know him around this point didn't even know that he was married. Tom became the mayor of Odyssey, and Bart Rathbone tried to smear Tom's name by creating a scandal around Agnes. Tom finally came public about Agnes' condition, coinciding with his decision to not seek re-election. Agnes disappeared from the show again until the Novacom saga when the Nova Box's medical counterpart was used to treat Agnes. While she appeared to be recovering at first, even to the point of coming home to the farm, she quickly relapsed to a point worse than she had ever previously been. She was returned to Hillingdale, where she slowly began to recover once more, with Tom's help. In album 62's Legacy, we learned that Tom had passed away several years previous, sometime between the present and album 50. Given that Agnes wasn't mentioned in the execution of the will, it can be assumed that she probably passed away shortly previous to Tom. I know. Um, There's not a lot of episodes with Agnes. This is our first ship so far where both members are dead. I know. Sad. Yes. Actually, this is the only of. ship on this list where both people in it are dead. They're ghosts. Yeah. And they love each other. They love ghosts. They love ghosts. And it's beautiful. Wait, um, what about Wilbur and his other wife? Well, that is... Did they become love ghosts? Yeah, while I they mean... they waited? I mean, Jesus does address that directly in the Bible. Wait, he does? Yeah, that's why he's like, there's no marriage Wait. in heaven. Because they're like, what happens if, like, oh. a couple gets married, yeah, and the husband that's... dies, and then she marries his brother, and he dies, and Wait, she marries so his brother? Wait, so your marriage is annulled? Yes. Oh, is that why it's like, Cause cause like that do you part? Yes. What if you Cause die, they, they're like, Jesus, and then what you happens? get revived? Is your marriage <laughs> yes. done, and you you're have to free. get remarried? You're now free and clear. Because they're like, Jesus, what happens if this woman were, marries, like, all seven of these brothers as they keep on dying suspiciously? <laughs> and then what happens when they die? Is she married to all seven of them? And he's like, no, there's no marriage in heaven except y'all's marriage to me. And they're like, put a ring on it. Yeah. Yeah. Remember that verse in the Bible? Thou shalt put a ring, put on, a ring it. on it, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so, yeah, there's lots, there's years in this one because, you know, go back and listen to our Tom lore. It was a surprisingly in-depth episode, and I went to my Tumblr post that was, like, the transcripted version of that like, episode. And you just, like, copied and pasted it. In an extremely abridged long. version. It was, like, a thousand words, the one that the original full-length one. Um, this gives me a lot of feelings, or at least it did until I saw that you put a typo and it said Agnew. Yeah, that kind of, that kind of ruined the mood, I have to yeah. say. That was really funny, though. I'm, well, I was able to make a solid historical political joke out of it, so yeah, at least we recovered with that. I don't know who Agnew is. I wouldn't know who Spiriti Agnew was if it wasn't for that lady in Black oh, Clouds who always yells I've the names heard. of former vice presidents. I recognize that name. Yeah. Spiro T. Agnew, look at it coming down out there. Oh, T. Agnew. Yes. I thought it was just like a really long name. No. Like Spiro, it's Spiro T. Agnew. T. Agnew. No, it was just like a really, really long name. Yeah. Like Pocahontas, but Spiro T. Agnew. <laughs> Pocahontas is a long name. That's not that long. Yes, it is. It's not that long. How many letters is it? It's a like lot. Like 10? Yeah, it's a long name. Mine's Yours only is eight. eight. Yeah, but like more than eight is a lot. <laughs> so, Tom and Agnes have so, even though they don't appear in a lot of episodes, they have a lot of like incredibly like beautiful moments as a couple together. Mostly in the other woman, there's a lot of like really strong stuff that, that is you know how their much ship episode. Tom cares for Agnes and tries to protect her and do whatever he can to support her through all the things that she's been and through and they have that like, beautiful quote about like the, mental illness and like the agnes riley's of the world and the tom riley's of the world who helped them um, head canon that tom whenever he goes on a trip he picks up a new color hair dye to bring back no. to her um and there's also and they're all like really ugly colors that she doesn't like but she's like oh this yeah it's beautiful the and she wears it anyway scene is an exit where tom is fighting with wit because he's like i have my agnes back and mm. you, no one is gonna take her away from me and then she's like timmy's coming home from softball and then he's and then she doesn't remember his name and he's so mm. heartbroken and then there's one of the final epilogue scenes and exit oh, she's looking at the flowers where she smells the like, flowers yeah and tom is just like good night agnes and i'm like ah. <laughs> and then and then of course if you always gotta mention this whenever we talk about the two of them thanksgiving at home mm -hmm. or not thanksgiving at home um thank you god and they renew their wedding vows yeah at eugene and katrina's you wedding you never mentioned that in this no i didn't Failure, Devin. Well, I didn't think it. Failure. I didn't think it was something significant enough to put into the thing. Failure. But yeah, they renewed their vows and stuff. And it, was it was beautiful, it was and great. she was wearing like that dress, uh -huh. and Tom saw her, and he was just like, "Oh, making my heart. making her go doki doki in his kokoro." Yeah, it was. I imagine he had like the same face, maybe to like. No, no, I was gonna say maybe to. He a was looking set, all deflated. No, no. He had the same expression Jack did when Jack first saw Joanne. Aww. Yeah. They're a good couple, and they I like are. them. They are good. Next, we have another good question mark, a close no, friend couple. No, they are good, except for, like... Well, I mean, they're oh, a good couple, well, but they're just not good oh, people. Oh, I thought you meant the fact that, like, it's questionable if he's slightly emotionally abusive to her there yeah times. there's also doris's because there's line. that one line yeah which i mentioned in here yeah okay. yeah okay so bart and doris um i think this is our seventh item they on the have list. more episodes than tom and agnes too yeah but well, i guess they, they have like more I said, episodes to get they they're in the show more than agnes is, yeah and so. like i said the counting is kind of questionable what you want to count is like a couple developmental episode for some of these pairings um did Roughly. you count the wedding vow episode in the last one? They count last. Oh, no, I didn't because I forgot about the renewing wedding vows. I just okay, remember the then wedding they dress. They have 11, okay. so they're tied with All Bart right. and Doris and numbers. It makes sense because Walker had missed in. Um, 11 episodes, roughly. Bart Rathbone and Doris Veneropoli met at a funeral where they were both individually running different scams excuse me, on the attendees. They were instantly enamored with each other and decided to create a telemarketing scam together to con money donated to saving dogs from Dog. extinction. After the police busted them, Doris had the chance Bark. to escape. 
Bart. 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 Beagles are really terrifying. <laughs> Doris had the chance to escape, but chose to return for Bart rather than abandon their love. They were married and had Rodney. Where are you? Oh. Bart eventually opened the electric... Pa oh, you moved it. Okay. Right. Palace after being approached by Dr. Regis Blackard. Well, Doris was a housewife complaining that Bart didn't allow her to leave the house enough, although that might be because they didn't write her in enough episodes. That's true. Despite their bickering, they would frequently collaborate on schemes to extract exorbitant scums from their... <laughs> sums from their customers. I don't know. It might be the other one, too. They're it might be scum both. sucking their customers. <laughs> Like that kind of fish that they, is they on do. A shark. I mean, fun fact: the Electric Palace does sell scum suckers in aisle eighteen. <laughs> um, honestly, I don't really think we should read too much into that one line Doris has about mm -hmm. Bart keeping her locked up in the house because I think that's just like a writing joke about the fact that like it took so long for her to actually appear in episodes. Yeah, more than anything else, and the fact that like Bart's in way more episodes than she is when. If Odyssey was real life, you would see her, like, a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I was gonna say, then again, they never made any of those jokes with Maud, but Maud's not even mentioned enough to warrant those jokes, probably to the point where they forget that she exists. Maud is literally, frequently. her voice is heard in literally three episodes, and one of them is just oh, they her. Oh, were saying her voice is heard literally every episode, and she has no presence no. in Odyssey, because she's no, played by Chris. No, her, her voice is heard in literally three episodes, and one of those is just laughter yell through the phone. No, and she says, come on, Bernard. That's true, that's true, you're Do right. Do not take away those lines from her, Devin. Okay, she doesn't have I'm very sorry, many. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She needs what she can every, get. Every, every, she more needs every iota. every millisecond of screen time she can get. Otherwise she'll have nothing. She's kind of present in the Eugene Returns trilogy when Bernard's talking to her on she's the phone, like, but you don't actually hear her. Yeah, she's on the other side of the phone. No, Ma, not like Uncle Pete. He didn't get kicked by a cow. Oh, I love um, her anyways, so much. Anyways. Um, anyways. Well, Bart talk Norris. about that later. Wink. Are you are you saying wink or are you winking? <laughs> Both. <laughs> okay. Uh okay. They man, they're like one of the only other couples on this list that actually have their own kids and not like the kids of a past relationship or something like that. Oh. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'll give you that. Um also they're one of the only Couple, no, no, never mind. I was gonna say they're one of the only couples where we actually get to see the meeting, except for I think we get this to see meeting all for of almost these all of these meeting, except for George and Mary and George Mandy and, and Trent, Mary and Mandy and Trent, and also Tom and Agnes. Yeah, Tom and Agnew. Yeah, so Bart and Doris, you know, they're fun. They have a they're fun. They're they have a, a more fun. chaotic family dynamic that is good for but comedy like, stuff. They're so much fun every time we're there. I mean they're horrible. Yeah. But they're so much fun. And like they're really good at banter. Like you can tell they have fun. And whenever one of them does something sweet for the other one, you can just like tell how much they love each other and it's like really beautiful. Like, whenever Tom, or not Tom, I mean Walker, but whenever I mean, Bart does this... anything for Doris, she's always like, aww, Bart! And it's cute. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Doris impersonation. How was it? I, mean, I don't know. There's a, there's a couple lines, like, when she's talking about, she's like, oh, if I was the mayor's wife, I'd be going to all the supermarket openings, and we say, hi, how are you? And he's like, ah, quiet, Doris. And stuff like, I don't know, he does, like, shut her down a number of different times on things. Yeah. Um, so it's like, mm, how mm. much is comedy? How much should we be concerned about things? Or I just think the general we should always be slightly issues, concerned. The, just the general issues that go on in any relationship, though, or most relationships. I mean, we're also comparing them against some pretty benchmark relationships on this list. Yeah, so I it's, think, it's, like, it's part kind of, of it could be the fact that sampling pool even though we've seen the beginning of the relationship mm -hmm. there's so much like we don't 
know about. Yes. So they could have like this friendly bickering thing where like from an outside perspective you're like should I should I be worried and it's like it's honestly it's like that bit with Vanellope in the Wreck-It Ralph 2 trailer it's like should I call the police and they're like no we're fine um, this is just the way we are yeah they're all right because um, like for all the comments that they both make neither of them ever see seem like upset or anything like that uh-huh like, legitimately number okay, number eight. upset, like, something bad seriously going on. Number eight, Mandy and Trenton. The youngest couple on our Four list. episodes. Four episodes. They are not... Uh, this, was, this was kind of... I counted... But... I was like, present long ago, mum's the word, class reenactment, and I was like, I think sort of, like, um out of our hands kind of thing or uh uh what's the book uh the tales of a small town thug where it's like kind of counting the beginning of her saga and trent was worried about and stuff i was like it's a bit of a stretch it's almost like three episodes mm -hmm. but uh. um sorry did you count the valentine yeah yeah, okay. yeah um the youngest couple on our list i'm kind of are... remiss without that one do you say mom's the word yes okay yeah, there's not much. There's not I much know. with these two. Um, they are the only couple not to have been married by present day, but we know they will be in the future. Mandy Strasberg and Trent Dwight have been friends since early childhood. Mandy was originally seen as an extremely young contemporary to Jared's friend group, but she later fell more in line with Trent age-wise, presumably because of the Nova Boxes side effects. Mm -hmm. Although she's definitely older than Trent, Mandy, you cougar. Um, some theorize that... Oh. Yes. I didn't even see that uh -huh. was the next line. Yes. Never mind. Nova Box stuff. Regardless, she and Trent Possibly. ended up in the same grade, both brilliant students ahead of the curve. They would regularly study together, although neither seemed aware of any deeper emotions until the present long ago in album 44. Unless Mandy purposely got held back so she could be Aww. with Trent. Even though she definitely didn't have feelings for him then. <laughs> After Trent acted as Max Hampton's wingman to deliver an anonymous Valentine's Day present to Mandy, Trent slowly started to develop feelings for Mandy himself. Mandy, meanwhile, knew that Trent delivered the valentine and assumed he was the original sender. Their emotions were rarely discussed thereafter in the show, save for Mum's the Word and a class reenactment. They still never reached the point of dating before the hiatus. <sighs> the Strasburgs will have so much more to do before the hiatus. <laughs> but the flash forward to the far future and present long ago tells us they will eventually be married and have at least one child and two grandchildren. Because the Strasbourg's going to be so important, so much to do with class reenactment, and oh, Mandy was in that interview so much! I'm not bitter or anything, though. They clearly weren't expecting the hiatus to wipe the character slate clean when they made that decision. I don't care. <sighs> they brought back so many people. Ugh. They mentioned Robin. They could bring back, back these Robin. two if they wanted to. Or was Robin the one who was only in the extra scene? Yeah. No, I meant post hiatus. Remember, Melanie and Robin were mentioned by Dale and Ann. Oh yeah. In the labyrinth. You're right. But like, Mandy and Trent can come back if they really. Do. I bet Arya would be up for that. They. I don't know who plays Trent though, so. It's, I, don't, um, I don't remember what his name is. I remember sorry i was thinking about jared and i spilled all my water <laughs> it's what he would have wanted <laughs> that's the most victoria thing i've ever done in my whole life <laughs> it's because i was thinking about um brandon gilberstadt about the fact that yeah he's been in a lot of episodes post hiatus and i was like they could bring back jared and then i spilled all my water because i got excited <laughs> and i was thinking they could have Jared and Mandy and Trent all in one episode and I spilled all my water all over myself because it made me really happy and now I'm tearing up a little bit because that thought just makes me happy of them all coming back. I need it to happen. I'm not. How are you? 
I uh, I like Trandy. I want, I want the quote to be on my gravestone. Uh-huh. I was just thinking about Jared and Mandy and Trent, and it made me tear up a little bit, and I spilled um, my water. Maybe I just got water in my eyes. No, I'm definitely crying. That was a joke. But... Uh, well, both, probably. Yeah. Um, no, Trandy is a great ship, and... Even though we didn't get to see it much, I'm glad that it tra- uh, gained so much traction in the fandom. It's because they were really cute, and we never really get to ship the and kid got, characters, and yeah. have like an actual canon kid character ship. Yeah. Is nice. Because this is the only time we got like actual canon future visions. I so. mean, we... Arguably, Priscilla and Barrett were maybe going to be canon. Yeah. But... They're the next closest they thing that we've had. Vanished into the void. Oh, I'm salty Rest about it or anything. Rest in pieces, guys. I really liked your characters. Please come back. Please come back. Priscilla and Barrett and Jay were one of the best. I mean, things I know that's that ever happened. I know Priscilla's Odyssey. actress, something green. She went and got like a show on oh. ABC or something. Yeah, and then Barrett's. Actually, I don't know why Barry left. His voice changed and they still let him stay, so there's like... Yeah, I know. It's confusing. No reason. Unless they were like, we literally can't do anything without like, Priscilla for you, so you need to go. I like Trent Mandy. I'm surprised they didn't do more with their friendship throughout Mandy's dealing with her parent stuff. I wish they did. Actually, I, I do really like, though, that she was going to tell... Trent about it, and that was really early on. It was in Mom's the Word, right? Yeah, and that was like right when issues started coming up. It was a little bit after. It started um, in 46, and that was in 48. Well, yeah, and she was like, I need to talk to someone other than just Liz, and I need emotional support. And she was going to tell Trent, but probably what happened was he said like i have a crush on you and she's like oh that's awkward and then and then she's like i feel like i can't really interact with you now and then so she just kind of stayed away and i think that's why we don't see any trent and mandy stuff during the divorce which is, is completely why understandable all, all romance is tragedy and terrible <laughs> Abolish so. romance. A good <laughs> but, theme but for honestly, this episode that we're doing. <laughs> but honestly, I do feel like that is why they don't interact a lot mm-hmm. during it. And that is a completely understandable It's very valid. Manly had hear. more than enough emotional it's stress like, that I, she was going this through. Is liter- no, she yells to Trent on candid conversations. Uh, this is literally the last the thing, thing in I my life I need yes. right now. And then she leaves. Oh, that poor girl. Oh, she deserved more. Everything. By which we mean more episodes. Everything worked out. Yeah, she deserved way more episodes and everything else. Couple numero nuf. George and Mary Barclay. Or Georgie. Like that character from The from it? Wonderful Life. Ah. Uh, oh, wait. No, I'm thinking of it. You're right. <laughs> Never mind. They're very similar. They're very I can see similar. how you could confuse Stephen King's It. And Stephen King's It's a Wonderful Life. They both have water of course. in them. Victoria, they it's a wonderful... They both have wonder- water at the beginning. It's Characters a wonderful life. Characters fall underwater. Georgie's chasing his boat and, like, water's leading the paper boat. And then he the falls sewers. into the sewer and loses his hearing in one ear. Yeah. That's how it goes, right? Yeah. And... And then when Pennywise catches you, then you are never born like the Weeping Angels. <laughs> You know what they say. It's not with the Weeping Angels. Every regret. time Pennywise eats someone. A bell rings. A bell rings. Yeah, that's what they say. So, 14 episodes. Um, not much is known about the early stages of George and Mary Barclay's relationship, but we've seen them go through plenty in their time on the show. At the onset, George was working for a large corporate office. I don't remember what his actual position was because I didn't want to take the time to look it up in the episode. While Mary was a stay-at-home mom, (laughs) formerly a working woman, probably before the birth of their two kids, Donna and Jimmy. We saw their marriage go through much turmoil as George was laid off in Our Daily Bread in album 17. Mary, Donna, and Jimmy all got jobs as George sought out new employment and George finally felt that God was leading him down a more difficult path than expected when he joined seminary to become ordained. At the same time, Mary discovered that she was pregnant with their third child. The family went through an extremely stressful period as George was studying constantly while Mary was dealing with her third pregnancy and the family tried to hold things together on a new shoestring budget. 
They faced many tough choices along the way and ended on the toughest choice when they decided to uproot their family and move many states away to a very difficult ministry at the First Church of Pokenberry Falls in New England. Their problems didn't stop as they faced constant opposition from Barry Lionel and financial hardship from the failing local economy. This culminated in the breaking point of George in It's a Pokenberry Christmas, album 31, which ended in George finally receiving the rallying support from the community needed to stabilize their family situation. Of course, we don't really know how long they supported them, so anything could have gone down for all we know. No, wait, no, George was still doing good and life in the grave. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, Jimmy, in fairness, though, had moved on to a two-horse town yeah. at that point. Yeah, but like he wasn't allowed touching either of the horses. He had to like clean up after the horses. Aw, that's rural life for you, right? <laughs> Am Aww, I right? Poor Jimmy. Oh, Castlegar. Oh, you're talking about Castlegar. <laughs> I was talking about the fact that his life sucked and everything hated him. It did. It was kind of like um, it's Jay in There and Back Again. Did you ever notice that? You ever notice the similarities? Uh, you mean living in the J? Yes. Part five? Uh huh. Part five and a half, please. Part five um, and three quarters? Point five, two point eight. The one where they talk living about. Living in the J, two point eight. The one where they talk about uh, the process of recording down that Scottish story and dotting all the eyes. Mm -hmm. Part 5.8 is the part where Final they talk remix, about crossing HD the Final remix, HD Yeah. Um, we're so bad at jokes. Yep. What else is new? <laughs> Happy five year anniversary! <laughs> Thank you, almost the almost 300 people who are subbed to us and the 50, over 50,000 views that you've given us on this channel. Um, yeah, George and Mary, they're cool. We don't really know anything about their past except the most we know about their no, past. No, we know that like... Mm. Oh, they, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Touche. <laughs> Good talk. I don't even know if we were talking we're about so, the same I'm thing. I'm sure that we were. Okay, we were, were we talking about the vow. And what he says about, like, proposing to you in the cabin. We didn't propose in that cabin. Is that what you were talking about? Yes, it was. Yes, I knew it. <laughs> See? We're so... Actually, the what I was originally going to say was, except for the one line where there were th where there's a will, and they were like, should we move? Because, like, we grew up in this house. We had our children in this house. I'm like, okay, that at least confirms how Literally long. Literally in the house. They didn't move maybe was... to the hospital Yeah, they did, enough. like, the water birth thing yeah. on the bathtub. Um, just like it, the quiet place or whatever that yeah. new movie and then the Jim from the office is called. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the water started spilling over the bath when the baby came out and then they take a bucket and then they threw it on the TV and it set on fire. Yeah. Um, and that's how Jimmy was born. <laughs> yeah. He came into this world like he went out of it with, oh, with flooding and over shorted exploding electric appliances. The way he would have wanted. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so, no, is uh, I, <laughs> was gonna, good I was going to say that, and They're then you good. said, oh, no, there was a thing, and then I was like, yeah. oh, yeah, and I remember yeah. the same thing, and I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm, I love that we're so in sync that out of, like, 830 episodes And now, those are the ones just starring the Barclays, that yeah. aren't, are not even all the other ones. That out of that many episodes, that literally... Two maybe ninety second conversation that we locked on within a second. I mean, that's one of those things where, like, really, the episode ends and everyone's laughing, and you're like, "Stop laughing!" <sighs> you just tricked your children into thinking you had a divorce or whatever this yeah. episode was about. Yeah, leave them alone. Newsflash: Parents fight sometimes, kids. Oh yeah, that's a good thing to talk about with. Used to well, yeah, that's what, that's like, what I. And the struggles that's too, that's too. why I put it down here. Struggles. That's why I put it on the list is because we get to see them go through so many hardships. They go through all these struggles. We're like, and like I don't know baby. how we're gonna do this. George is like, I'm really struggling, and Mary's like, Okay, we're gonna support you. And then Mary's like, I'm really struggling. George's like, Okay, we're gonna support you. And they work together as a family Team and work. as a couple, and they pull through it. And in the end. What do they have to show for their efforts? They move to Pokenberry Falls where they have to work three jobs to make ends meet. But 
by dang it, that's where they're supposed to be. I'm gonna say another thing that's controversial. Even though the Barclays have father, mother, older sister, younger, slightly bratty brother, and babe boy, the same kind of family format that the Incredibles have. Like the I thought you were going to say elf. That too, <laughs> I guess. Except for they don't have an alien. I mean, they have a dog. Normal. Is, they have a weird looking dog. So. <laughs> um, which they call elf. But anyway, they have the same structure as the Parr family. And I would argue that all the relationships are like a billion times better than the Parr family. If you have not seen Incredibles 2, stop listening for like a minute. Okay, spoilers, spoilers. on screen until until you stop. No, yeah. that's okay. We'll just put it on. Okay, um, in Incredibles 2, Bob is like complaining all the time. He's all wimpy because like... Helen is doing a job, and he's like, I don't have a job, I want to be doing this job, and he's just like, yeah, for, like, basically the entire movie, and then he's only not like that once everything works out for him at the end, and I'm like, Bob, you're kind of trash, you know that, right? And then, but, like, we have an episode in Odyssey where George is like, oh, I'm really angsty and upset that Feeling I don't have a job. very emasculated. And by like it all. everyone else is looking after everything. And also, this is like, I know The Incredibles takes place in the 60s. The 50s, yeah. I was going to say that is something to consider. Um, but the early 50s. Like, this is looking back on it for The Incredibles. Uh -huh. This was like present day for the Barclays, and this would have been a long time ago, too. Not as long ago, but still. It's in the 90s, so um, there's that. That's a good point. And, like, George took it so much better. Mm -hmm. Like, he learned to grow up and to deal with it. Yeah. And. Is that the end of the spoiler thing? Yeah. What do you think? Okay. Do you agree? Do you agree? I do agree. Thank you. You're correct. I'm right. People who just came back in from the spoilers are like, I don't know what happened, but Victoria was right. Unless, like, That's all you need to know. Unless they can lip read, in which case it depends on what frame rate this pumps you out at. depends? Yes. It depends. Uh-huh. About Agnew. <laughs> you know what, Victoria? Rune! <laughs> I also said honey honey for Penny and Wooten instead of honeymoon. No, that's another thing you said. Chump of the cump. <laughs> so Bernard and Maud, <laughs> our final couple on the list, Bernard and Maud with like four episodes. You get to read the description. Bernard met Maud one day while he was on a lunch break eating at Chickadoodle. You know what I finally realized? Okay, so you know how I thought it was it's, chicken... You know how I thought it was chicken noodle it's, for the longest time? No. And then everyone in the world corrected me. And they're I, like, it's chickadoodle. I always D. thought it was chickadoodle, you doodle. Well, because doodle isn't a food and noodle is. I'm like, chicken yeah, noodle. They doodle have like, like cockadoodle They have like chicken noodle. Yeah, like and I realized rooster. people are like, chicken doodle. And I was like, I guess it's supposed to be like a play on Chick-fil-A. And then last night I was like, it's like cockadoodle doodle <laughs> Yeah, it's also, it's Chick-fil-A and cock doodle do combined. I realized it last night. <laughs> oh my gosh. I... Once I was finally hey typing guys, it out. Hey guys, it's been a fun five years, but the podcast needs to end now. I'm going. <laughs> I'm going now. Goodbye. Oh, I'm so stupid. Goodbye. I can't get through. There's too many <laughs> things. This is my plan. The plan succeeded. You blocked the exit. Mon, I can't leave. Mon I'm was trapped. a psychology student working as Choodles the chicken mascot at the restaurant. She performed the Heimlich on Bernard when he choked on his sandwich, and the manager bizarrely and terrifyingly told Bernard where Maud went to school. Yeah. I brought the. I know we already reviewed prequels of love, and I brought this up before, but like. Yeah, and it's not even the thing where it's like, oh, this was from like the 80s or 90s or something like that. It's mm -hmm. like, no, Prequels of Love uh, would have come out and... Would have taken place before this, because it was a flashback. Oh, yeah. But it's but that still... doesn't matter. There's no excuse. He came up, he's like, hey, that young woman who works for you, could you please tell me where she lives? I find lives? her very attractive. I need where to does... know her yes. blood type. 
And where it's does, like, okay. <laughs> where does she keep her spare key, perchance, could you tell me? And at what hours did, you know, where could I make a copy of, like, what's her social insurance number? What's her blood what's, type? What does she smell like? Could you um, could you give me, like, an annotated list of her weekly schedule? Could you please... And when she's in isolated positions? As kind to tell me if she knows any self-defense. <laughs> yeah. What are her weaknesses? <laughs> Like uh, mosquitoes or cake, for example. Is she allergic to... Um, chloroform. Yeah. Um, I was trying to remember what it was called. <laughs> oh, I'm plenty familiar with chloroform, Victoria. Yeah, I know. You've that almost sounds, made yourself pass out. That sounds creepy when I say it like that. No, yeah, I've, it is. The only person I've chloroformed is, is yourself, me. Is yourself, because you are dumb. Uh, yeah. Um, where what, Maud went to I school. I say in a loving way. He joined her intro to psych class to try and hit on her. It took some work for Ma to realize what was happening, but she was receptive when she got there. <laughs> for some reason. Yes. We barely see her in present day, but Bernard mentions her frequently. Despite Bernard's curmudgeonly personality, Ma is one of the few people who can chide him and actually get through to him, and Bernard makes it clear that he loves her deeply and supports her for all that she does for him. They're so cute. From, and I there's love some them heavy so inferences much. I'm making here because yeah, it's very no, little I agree. time with Mon. But I we agree. just we needed another couple to fill out this list. Like, so. um with uh um um Yeah. Yeah? With the curse? No. What's the episode called? Sorry, not the curse, the chain letter one. It's no, the one with where... Silent Night. No, Prequels of Love. Yes! Prequels of Love! Uh -huh. um, out of the three couples that are discussed being Wet and Jenny, Bart and Doris, mm -hmm. and Bernard and Maude, um, they are definitely the ones that like have the least screen time. They have the least screen time out of like any couple. You could probably meet an extra couple in one in one shot episode that couple that was friends with the parkers more... that like went to the baseball game and oh, like had yeah, the baby she has like more screen time than yeah. Maude. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if you just remember like... when camilla got up on the at the oh uh, i don't want, no i don't want to think about that <laughs> um but if you just like listen to the way bernard talks about her and like Dave Madden's delivery on, you're gonna laugh. You're gonna laugh when I say it. don't the laugh. The line, the don't line laugh. that he don't says. Laugh. Don't laugh. When, he when says, you like, learn that Bernard she is can a furry, really make a chicken sandwich or something like that. Oh, when like, he's oh, like the wingspan yeah, on. Yeah, when he's like, she still has that chicken suit. Oh my gosh! Like the oh, what are we role saying? play with. Uh, no, I don't want. To I know. Think, I'm uh, like. Oh, I don't. Want, no. I just made myself throw up a little I can't wait bit. to the live the live adaptation of mm. uh, of AIO where Bernard is played by Jeremy Dooley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, no, we're not gonna talk about this. I regret asking you to put Maud and Bernard on this list. Devin had like this list of all these different people and some of the ships that he suggested I shut down immediately. One of them I think was Buck and Emily and I was like, get that out of here. I didn't put that on there. Yeah, you did. I never would have thought of that. No, you I def did. I soups I'm did not. I'm pretty sure you did. I absolutely you did not. did. You covered them in soup and you did. I, d I covered them in chicken noodle soup. Yeah, Chicken and then I was like, hey, no, mod, I never... e mod exists, and you're like, oh my gosh, I forgot about Mod existing. I was like, you and the writers, too. I Let's never, put her on the list. I never would so. have even thought of Buck and Emily. Whatever, you liar. Buck and Jules, maybe, I put on there. That might have been Buck and Jules. That sounds more also... likely. No. <laughs> no. Um... But, um... Bernard and Maude, they're so cute. They have, like, I barely still... any screen time. Like, in Silent Night, you can just, like, hear how... I was gonna say excited he is. How but deeply he, unexcited, like, but that's what I'm saying. Unexcited. He still supports her anyways. He doesn't want to be there. They but love he's, each other He's so still there, much. and she's like, Bernard, let's go in the pool! Woo! Come on, Bernard! Bernard's, <laughs> Bernard's like... like 
And he's just like, you're lucky I love you so much. I love uh, Maud's confusing characterization where, like the line we said earlier, but like... Where she's like not a Uncle, psychologist. Not Uncle Pete. She right. didn't get kicked by a cow. Oh, no, yeah, my, Maud. My excuse? My, the like microwaves. And she's so confused. I'm like, you're talking about like being confused about mem like retrograde amnesia and getting kicked by a cow. She has a degree in clinical psychology. <laughs> My excuse for that is the fact that it is the middle of the night. That's fair. You know what? And they That's called valid. her. <laughs> it's and like then, three a.m. <laughs> and that you speak like not English. You know what? You speak French when you're tired. It has happened before. And no, not just. Well, don't say it casually. It happens a lot. And then mom Some says like, an easy question like, hey, what do you want on your sandwich? And you say, little people as a response. And it's, That was a long time ago. Like, no, that's not how that works. <laughs> and like mom yelling, get up. And you yelling back, I'm washing my face while you're asleep. Sometimes no, in okay. French. At least, but... besides me speaking French and once asking for roasted unicorn horns, the best one I ever gave was, was when I yelled at mom in response to, what do you want for breakfast? You can't wear white to... What was it? You can't wear white to social events after graduation. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best one out of the ones that I said in English while I was still mostly yeah. asleep. Yeah. But that's that's been a while since something happened because I haven't lived at home for years and years. But so Maud saying so him saying radio waves yes, this and is, her being this like This is valid, Victoria. You're microwaves? Correct. Like yeah, I would do like the same thing. Uh huh. So No, you're right. Even if someone was asking me something I was like I knew in mm -hmm. detail and stuff like that, you're like, Hey, what's the main character of Kingdom Hearts name? And I'd be like and you'd be like, close There's enough. There's There's Strelitzia. And you'd be like... When like equals one prayer. Sure. <laughs> um, Stop. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's our list. I thought you just got really <laughs> emotional over Strelitzia for a second. No, no of course not. <laughs> no, that is our list, and we should wrap it up because it's been a long video. Let's uh let's recourse through that list again in no particular order. Eugene and Katrina, beautiful, lovely, stunning, A plus, ten out of ten. Pen Yu Mutin, cutest couple ever, would die for them. Only known him for five minutes. Actually I wouldn't have died for them at that point, but only known him for five episodes in a relationship. I would die for them. Connie and Mitch. Ah <laughs> Went and Jenny. So cute. Cute, cute. Jack and Joanne, cinnamon rolls gave her an elevator to die for. Heck I yes. I think you said gave for an elevator. That too. The, the, the controversial, like, uh, home wrecker. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tom and Agnew, beautiful, pure, unfortunately, probably deceased. Bart and Doris. Sitting in a tree. Questionable? Maybe. They're cute anyway. Trent <laughs> Mandy. Uh, good. Need more. Hiatus. Ah! George and Mary. Good. Struggle. Strife. Come out on top. Heck yes. Bernard and Maud. A plus. Needs more screen time. Good. That's my summary. How was that? That was good. Thank yeah, that's you. all we needed. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so what are we talking about next time, Victoria? Uh, sure. What did we just, what did you listen to earlier today? I know, but I want it to be the other one. I know, well, that's the next one after the next one. Uh, always the episode of a couple months ago, Last always month? do your best dish. And. Earlier today, you listened to it. And my brain stopped. Mm hmm Name. A Time for Action, Part 2. You weren't supposed to tell me! Well, I'm sorry, Victoria. We're like an I hour and 40 had... minutes into this episode. I knew it had the letter F in it as the beginning letter of a word, but I forgot what it was. I wanted to say Force. I think I was going to say The Force Awakens, honestly. <laughs> okay! Yeah, next time it's our review of Force Awakens, guys. Um, uh, we're going to talk about we're talk why about our predictions we for Solo. The Last Jedi... And no one else did. Okay. Bye. <clears throat> so yeah, that's what's next time. Yeah. Uh, until then, thank you for joining us. Sorry, 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 YouTube. Sorry, this episode was so long. I've been never friends. I was a lot more, sir. I'm so
Yeah, watching the Adventures in Odyssey podcast.